Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, I'd like to remind everybody, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Holy shit. That's the only way I can think to describe this past week and a day at this point, which, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into this. Um, I'm sorry for this being later than my normal episodes. Normally, I, I record and upload on Thursdays, and I very naively thought yesterday, I'm recording this on Friday, that I could just, you know, wait until after the Kavanaugh hearings, and I'll just record after that. And that's not how that worked out, because by the time I was done watching the Kavanaugh Ford hearings yesterday, it was like, I need several drinks and maybe like a run around my neighborhood and time to process what the fuck I just watched. So apologies for this being a little later than it normally is. But initially, even before yesterday's hearings, I had wanted to go ahead and discuss this whole past week that was. Because one day, you are going to have to explain this last week to your children. And they're not going to believe you. So I want to record this for posterity so that when that day comes, you can show your children, here, look at this. This shit really fucking happened all in one week. So I want to go back and I want to start pretty much right after I recorded the last episode of this podcast, not, not the book review, but the, the full, the Kavanaugh situation episode. Right after that, Ed Wieland, which if you do not know who Ed Wieland is, he is the president of a conservative think tank. Uh, He clerked for Scalia. He was deputy assistant AG under the Bush administration Basically, this is a guy who is very well known, very well respected in DC circles. He had started probably not quite a week before, but a couple of days before teasing that he had certain information. And I think the the exact quote from his tweets was, by the end of the week, Feinstein will owe Kavanaugh an apology. So last Thursday, he dropped this tweet thread. And what it was, was this half-cocked, wild conspiracy theory that Ford isn't wrong in saying that she was sexually assaulted. She's just fingering the wrong guy. And he had this whole thing laid out. Like, he had, like, like Zillow layouts of, like, this particular house. And the problem was that he named another dude. Like, he used his name and put it out on the internet, on Twitter, saying that, okay, maybe it was this guy because here's the house he grew up in, here's the floor plans, they match up to Ford's testimony about the bathroom and the staircase and blah, 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 blah. But he used dude's name and everybody was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, why would you, you don't do that? Don't put this on somebody else. Don't put somebody else's name out there. And so, obviously, this whole thing blew up because of that. And what he ended up doing was he deleted the whole tweet thread, obviously. And then he apologized. But he only apologized for, like, saying dude's name in public, which I'm not going to repeat it. But, oddly enough, kind of skip forward, the guy that he named is actually, turns out weirdly enough, the guy that actually introduced Ford to Kavanaugh. So yeah, but that was, that was a whole, like, that was a whole weird thing. And like I said, he had like, like these floor plans laid out. He had pictures of this guy and Kavanaugh side by side from back in the day. And like, oh, look, look how similar they look. Maybe she's just confused and this is a case of mistaken identity. And everybody was like, dude, no, don't do this. Like, no, don't stop. Stop it. Delete this. Walk it back. And he attempted to. And where his status is kind of right now is he tried to resign from his current position as president of conservative think tank. And they're like, nah, we're just going to put you on a leave of absence. Basically, like, we're not going to make it that easy for you. So that's where this started. And then after that, Trump finally tweeted about 
the the Blasey Ford situation. Now, mind you, this is this is last Thursday. In fact, actually, I think the Trump tweets were Friday morning. So much has happened since then. It's insane. This almost feels like I'm talking about ancient history. But Trump finally tweets about the situation. And what he does is, first of all, he calls out Ford by name. It's not like he's talking about an accuser or an allegation. He uses her name. And he says that if the attack was as bad as she says it was, she would have reported it. Hmm. Where, where have we heard this before? But then he also tweeted that if this was that bad, that the FBI should have investigated 36 years ago. And that's the one I stuck on because I was like, what the fuck? No, why would the FBI be investigating this 36 years ago? Like, that would be Maryland PD, not... It, what? Dude, no. Delete this tweet too. Like, oh my God. Like, it's just... And it it gets stupider from here. It all gets stupider from here. Okay, so moving on to last Sunday. And this is a situation that has been kind of evolving throughout the whole week, which is that Senator Grassley, who is the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, has been trying to set up this hearing that did ultimately happen on Thursday. But he had been trying in several different ways and several different times to nail down like a time and a place to make this hearing happen. So what he had done is for last Friday, he had set a 10 p.m. like moratorium, like I need to hear back from you by 10 p.m. on Friday. Otherwise, this is going forward without you. So set that. Ford's team asked for an advance. Grassley granted the advance. If I remember correctly, it was until Saturday at noon. And basically... And I'm I'm going to I'm going to talk about cuz I made notes about this throughout the whole week and I want to talk about my feelings on this in that moment because basically put a pin in them because it's changed. Basically what I was looking at this as was that Grassley is bending over backwards to try to make this hearing happen and to be as accommodating to Ford as possible at that time. And essentially he pretty much offered her everything she wanted within reason. I think the only thing really of contention that he wasn't willing to do was she wanted Kavanaugh to testify first, which that makes no sense. How are you supposed to testify to things? But anyway, that's not how it works in the legal system, but that's what she wanted. And he's like, no, but the rest of it, he was willing to give her her time, her place, everything like that. And even before that last final like package deal, he had made it clear that he was willing to do pretty much whatever she wanted up to and including going to her and taking her testimony in her home or wherever else she wanted to do it. So bear that in mind going forward because that's going to become important again. So basically my thoughts were at that point is she tentatively at that point agreed to the Thursday 10 a.m. But through her lawyers, because she never said anything, obviously this is all through her lawyers, that, okay, we agreed to that time and place, but there's still more negotiations that we have to do. And I was looking at that like, that's a real slap in the face to Grassley. Like he has bent over backwards to try to make this happen and basically try to like nickel and dime him through this. Like I was at that point, I was like, I I had kind of lost any kind of sympathy I had for this woman at that point. I was kind of like, you know what? Fuck it. You know, you, you may be telling the truth. You may not. I don't know. I don't care. At this point, you're playing the game. So like I said, put a pin in that because we're coming back to it later. So Sunday, Sunday night, this is when shit starts to go completely fucking sideways for everybody in everything everywhere. This is, this is really where the week pops off. Like all the rest of that was kind of like a precursor to explaining the insanity that's about to happen. Here's where it starts. Sunday night, the New Yorker drops a story. It's done by Ronan Farrow and Jane Meyer, who he normally works with apparently now on these stories. 
I'm sure you know who Ronan Farrow is. He's the one that broke the Harvey Weinstein story. He's done a lot of work on the Me Too stories. But they dropped this story about a woman named Deborah Ramirez. And her allegation is that during a freshman party at Yale, like they were having a dorm party, there was a lot of drinking going on, they were playing a drinking game, she admits that she was drunk, that during this party, during the, these sorts of games and stuff, that Kavanaugh flashed her. Like, basically, he, like, whipped his dick out in front of her. And here's the thing about the story. She never fingered Kavanaugh for this until now, obviously. But also, after spending, I think it was six days with lawyers trying to, quote-unquote, clarify her memory... All of a sudden, now it's Kavanaugh. And even in the story, she doesn't explicitly point blank say, yes, that was Kavanaugh's dick in my face. Basically, she says there was a dick in my face, and I'm assuming it was his because after that happened, he was over to my left, I believe she said it was, and he was like making a motion like he was like pulling up his pants and zipping them up. So even in the story, there's no positive ID that it was Kavanaugh that did this. And even in the telling of the story, she says that when this happened, apparently, that her comment was, that's a fake penis. Which, first of all, that's hilarious. I'm sorry. If some dude sticks his dick in your face and you're like, that's fake news, that's funny. But the second thing is, is it's kind of like, okay, even... Even she can't definitively ID this. And on top of that, nobody else that they contacted was willing to corroborate the story. It was pretty much anything between I don't remember this happening to I've never even met Brett Kavanaugh before in my life. So I'm sitting here, I'm reading this on Sunday night, and I'm just like floored that the New Yorker ran a piece this thinly sourced about something this incendiary right now. I was just like, I can't, I cannot believe they did this. And I still am in shock, even though so many more shocks have happened, but I'm still just like, I can't, I'm not going to say it's like journalistic malpractice, but it's, It's bad. Like, there's no, there's no reason they should have ran this, especially with no corroborating sources, with nobody else willing to go on record saying this happened. Right now, when he's already facing one charge of sexual assault that nobody's willing to corroborate, do not fucking pile on like this. Like, this was just so, so bad. And I cannot believe that Ronan Farrell put his name to this. Like, as much as he's done breaking Me Too stories, like not even just the Weinstein story and the follow-up on that, but plenty of other things too. I just, I could not believe that he would put his name to something this, this just, it's thinly sourced. Like it's actually, it's not even thinly sourced. It's not sourced. It's one woman saying this thing happened. Nobody's willing to corroborate it. And you still ran with it. And kind of the, the, the funny thing is, is I think it was the next day, the New York Times ran a piece. And within the piece, they were, they're basically reporting on the whole Kavanaugh situation. They included a paragraph in there where they basically point blank called out the New Yorker for running it in the first place. That's The paragraph basically says, well, we were also investigating this story too. And we did not run it because we cannot cooperate the story. And so we didn't run it, which is kind of like nanny, nanny, neener, neener. You got caught and we didn't. So there. Which, as snarky as that is, that is the correct stance. Like, you do not run a story like that without corroboration, without some kind of backup evidence. Because you're basically, you're accusing a man of, well... I guess, sexual assault. I'm not sure what that would really fall under at this point. But yeah, you don't you don't put that out there without some kind of backup evidence. But what I thought was interesting is that both the New York Times and the New Yorker cited that they started investigating this woman in this incident because Senate Democrats were investigating it. 
And that kind of set off a warning bell for me because I was like, okay, if Senate Democrats were investigating it and there was any kind of there there, I'm sure they would have took that ball and ran with it as far and as fast as they could. Uh, That would have been like Gronkowski running in for a touchdown in the Super Bowl. The fact that they didn't, I'm kind of wondering, first and foremost, how exactly the New Yorker and the New York Times found out that Senate Democrats were investigating this claim. And I, I wonder if this wasn't another case, like I said in the last episode, of Senate Democrats, at least at this point, not just strictly Feinstein's office, like I was saying about the original letter. I'm wondering if this wasn't them taking a piece of information, knowing that there was nothing that they could do with it, but if you seed it out to enough outlets and to the right outlets, somebody is going to run this story. So basically kind of, once again, using the media to do your dirty work for you, which is still, I still think that's what happened with the original letter. I stand by that. I think that was just somebody at this point Who knows? Feinstein's office denies it. The Guardian, which is the first outlet to run the original, the original article about the existence of the letter denies it. But somebody leaked it and there was a very few people that knew about it. So I got questions, but I think, I I think this is another case of that kind of situation, which is fucked up in and of itself. Like that should not be like, if you have something you investigate it, there's no there there, then there's no there there. You know, you don't seed it out and just let some some other organization run a story to put out there that, hey, there's this allegation that Brett Kavanaugh did a thing at a party. But I do want to take this moment to take like kind of a brief interlude from our our little navigation of last week to talk about that allegation in particular, because Going back to that, the only things that were out there in the public were were Ford's allegations and now Ramirez's allegations. Here's the thing. Trying to put a dude drunkenly flashing a woman in a party and putting attempted rape in the same sentence, which that's basically what this was trying to do, is it's basically trying to set up the notion that, hey, if Brent Kavanaugh did a dumb thing at a, at a dorm party, like if he was drunk and he flashed a woman, then by default, this must mean he also did this other thing. There's a huge, huge difference between those two acts. Like that's not, that's not even in the same ballpark. It's not even in the same league. It's not even in the same fucking sport. There's a difference between being drunk and pulling your dick out and thinking, ha ha ha, this is so funny. Look, we're going to get Debbie and pushing a woman into a room, shoving her down onto a bed, putting your hand over her mouth and trying to rip her clothes off. There's a huge difference there. And I think that's something that it's getting lost in a lot of this Me Too stuff but that there are different shades of sexual assault. And I don't even know if you would call the Ramirez situation a sexual assault, but these two things do not conflate. They do not lump together. And I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of you out there who have been young and dumb and drunk and you did something along those lines and you thought, ha ha ha, this is funny. This is cute. But you would never attempt to rape a woman. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, these two things don't go together. So I wanted to go ahead and say that because that was something that was really bothering me, is the conflation of those two things. But going forward, we make it to Monday morning. The sun rises, the birds are singing, and Michael Avenetti decides to insert himself into the situation. Yes, that Michael Avenetti. The Stormy Daniels, Michael Avenetti. He rolls up on Twitter saying that he now has a client who has information pertaining to the fact that Kavanaugh was part of this, I don't know, for lack of a better term, gang rape gang. Like that they were, that he and Mark Judge and other people, which why do we keep talking about Mark Judge? 
Like what he did doesn't matter. But anyway, basically they were part of this group of young men who would invite women over to parties and get them drunk, get them, get them like on drugs, you know, like get them incapacitated so that they could gang rape them. Yeah. Good times, right? So where this story kind of went from there is there started to be a rumor online that Avenetti had fallen for a Fortran, excuse me, a 4chan troll, which that was hilarious. And I wish that this plot line had stayed right there because it was a hell of a lot more fun when we were all clowning Avenatti and thought that this was a 4chan troll. But it doesn't. But we'll pick that up later. Also on Monday, Kavanaugh made it clear for the first time that he has no plans of dropping out of this. He has no plans on taking his name out of the nomination. He's still down to go to the hearing. He's still down for whatever. All right, moving on. Also another thing that happened on Monday, Kavanaugh went on television for the first time since this whole thing happened. He had an interview on Fox News, which the the upshot of it being the thing that everybody took away from it was that he claimed to be a virgin through high school. And as he said, several years after that, which I would assume would mean to include his college years, which it came up like the way it was phrased was that, that people were trying to kind of make it like, it was like kind of like a standalone, just blurred out. Like I was a virgin or that it was in relationship to Ford's allegations, which obviously she never alleged that he had sex with her. But what it was, was that this was in relationship to the Avenetti allegations that he was part of this gang rape gang. So it kind of got misconstrued by some people, probably purposefully, but okay. But the whole line of questioning was, that she was asking him about this, the Avenetti claims, and that was his response to it, was that I was not part of this this gang rape gang because I was a virgin in high school, and so no, I did not do that. So that, that turned into a whole thing about, like, are we really here? Are we really talking about dude's virginity? Like, this is, this is insane. It can't possibly get more insane than this. Oh, wait, there's more. So... What what those who want Kavanaugh to be guilty of this kind of went with was that, well, of course he's guilty of what Ford accuses him of, of the attempted rape, because he's quote-unquote sexually frustrated, which a lot of people took about one big deep breath away from calling him an incel. It was just, it was nuts. It's like nothing this dude can say is not going to be misconstrued. So... And then, and then, and then, and then, his, apparently his Yale freshman roommate went on Twitter and said, well, he told me that he wasn't a virgin and he told me about all this other things and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, yeah, because no young dude has ever lied about his virginity ever, ever, ever. That's never happened. Brett Kavanaugh would certainly be the first man to do that. (laughs) It's just like... And it, it's wild. It's Everybody ran with it. And I'm like, this is just some unsubstantiated tweet from some dude. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, yeah. I mean, even if that dude was completely telling the truth, young men lie about their sexual status and their sexual prowess and how many women they've had sex with and who they've had sex with and blah, 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 blah. That happens. So, yeah. His Yale freshman roommate saying that, well, he told me he wasn't a virgin means fuck all to me. Anyway, we need to keep it moving, because this is getting long. But in keeping with the theme of young men bragging about sexual conquests I didn't have, now let's move on to the yearbook story, which somebody found his, I think it was a senior year yearbook, and there's, I don't know, I don't have my senior year yearbook. I don't remember this being a thing. Maybe I mean, I'm, I'm a 90s baby, so maybe people did this back in the 80s. But there's like this like little blurb where like, I guess you can write in stuff about your senior year. But at any rate, they, he wrote in and a couple other dudes wrote in about being a Renat, Renata, 
I don't know how you pronounce your name, but being like a Renate alumni. And everybody took that and kind of ran with it and with other things that other people have written in the yearbook by basically saying that all of these dudes were saying that they had sex with this one girl. Anyway, that became a thing. They found Renate. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing her name. I really don't know. But per her account, not only did he never have sex with her, like they never even went out on a date together. Like yeah, like this, this didn't happen. Like he didn't have sex with this girl per her, her story. So again, like this is one of those things where like you can't really trust teenage boys to be completely honest about their sexual history and trying to go back in time and trying to figure out if somebody was being truthful or not about their virginity. Like this is insane. Like this, this guy is up for a Supreme Court seat and we're sitting here like dead ass discussing when he lost his virginity. It was fucking insane. But we're not done yet. It gets more insane. I promise. Next, we move on to his drinking, which in that same yearbook blurb, he talks about being the, the Keg City Club treasurer and 100 kegs are bust, which I mean... Yeah, you're a teenage boy. You're in a, you're in an elite school. You you come from money, whatever. I'm assuming you're drinking. I was at that age. I'm not mad at nobody. But here's the thing. A lot of people tried to make this weird straw man argument misconstruing what he had said back in the Fox News interview of saying that trying to make it sound like he said that he never drank and he never said that. He has never at any time said that he did not drink. What he had said in the Fox News interview was that he's never been blackout drunk. And even this is a thing going forward too. But yeah, he's never been shy about saying, yeah, I drank in high school. Which, whatever. Who gives a shit? Why are we fucking talking about this? (laughs) I don't care. I don't care when he lost his virginity. I don't care if he drank in high school. All of us, most of us did. I won't say all of us. I'm sure some of y'all were better people than I was in high school. Anyway, says same. Moving on. Wednesday. Let's roll it back to that Avenetti story. He does a document drop. Apparently, his client, and by the way, he tweets out this woman's full face and name and says, hey, please respect her privacy. And I'm just like, dude, no, you fucking did not. You did not just put this woman's name and face out here and ask everybody to respect her privacy. That's fucked up. But anyway, document drop. He drops her statement that she has given to, I don't, I don't think it was to him per se, but given it, it's sworn testimony saying that She witnessed Kavanaugh and Judge and other people verbally abusing women, groping women, pushing them, basically kind of like physically abusing them. But the kicker is she accuses them of, she says that she saw them participate in these gang right parties of drugging and drinking women like drunk and drugged up to be incapacitated so that they can have gang rapes. And there's a lot going on in here, but section 13 is really the one that is the most contentious. And I want to read it to you verbatim. So let me go ahead and pull that up. Section 13. In approximately 1982, I became the victim of one of these gang or train rapes where Mark Judge and Brett Kavanaugh were present. Shortly after the incident, I shared what had happened with at least two people. During the incident, I was incapacitated without my consent and unable to fight off the boys raping me. I believe I was drugged using Qualudes or some other similar similar place in what I was drinking. Which, that's weird verbiage. But basically, she's saying that she saw this happening, I guess, allegedly. Again, this is not corroborated. Like, nobody has come forward to corroborate this story. That she was going to these parties and there were these these gang rapes happening and that she was a victim of one of these incidences, but not that Brett Kavanaugh raped her. 
And I think that kind of got lost in the verbiage of this. Like I had to read it twice to kind of get that one. But of course, obviously, everybody ran with this that, oh, look, Brett Kavanaugh is part of the gang rape gang. And he's out here back in the day getting girls drunk and getting girls high and raping them. Like, holy shit. Like, oh, my God, that's 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 really vile to accuse somebody of without any kind of evidence, especially right now. Like to any dude, anywhere, anytime, don't get me wrong, but accusing him of, I mean, she's not even really accusing him of rape. She's accusing him of being like rape adjacent, I guess would be the best way to put it. But so that's still kind of hanging out there. This plot line is still circulating because Avenetti still says he has information, whatever. Nobody cares about Avenetti because Avenetti is pretty much a clown at this point. But, I mean, if he has information, please feel free to come forward with it sooner rather than later. Stop playing this for attention. But, yeah, that was just that. That sets up kind of going into the hearing and Kavanaugh's reaction to everything. So, mind you, at this point, he has one woman accusing him of attempted rape. One woman accusing him of flashing and one woman accusing him of being part of a gang rape gang. So this is, this is where he's at going into this. But we are not done discussing the insanity that happened before the hearings. Because Wednesday, like Tuesday night, Wednesday-ish, it got leaked. Or actually, I don't think it leaked per se. I think the Senate Judiciary Committee put it out this transcript of a call that they had with Kavanaugh because they've been having calls with him about all these different allegations and discussing with him and asking him like, okay, did you do this? No. Okay. Woo. Anyway, (laughs) in this particular call, apparently there was discussion of an anonymous letter and the letter written anonymously claiming to be somebody's mom of another anonymous person who says that this one time, I think it was sometime in the early 90s, she and her friends were out drinking with Brett Kavanaugh and he shoved her up against a wall in a sexually suggestive way. Like, okay. So anonymously sourced, anonymously reported letter of a wall shoving. And then... Then apparently there's been two other guys who have come forward saying that they were actually the ones that attacked Ford, not Brett Kavanaugh. And then there was a report that Brett Kavanaugh raped a woman on a boat in Rhode Island, but apparently not because it was recanted, but everybody ran with it anyway. And it's just like, at this point, it's like, make it stop, please. Dear God, make it stop. Like this is getting completely fucking out of control at this point. Like it's just... It, 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 the whole thing was just insane by the time Thursday at 10 a.m. rolled around. And then Thursday at 10 a.m. rolled around. So we finally get the hearing day, which honestly, I'm surprised that we got here and that Ford testified. I really thought that she wasn't going to. Like all the different roadblocks that were being put up, all the different hurdles, all the different excuses. I did not think that this day was going to come, but it came. It went And holy shit, was it quite something. Now, I had said on the last podcast when I was talking about this that I really didn't want to watch this hearing. Like, I didn't have the heart or the stomach to watch it. And I still stand by that because this hearing was kind of everything I expected it to be. But it was was better than I had thought. And the reason why I say that is because the Republican senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee, instead of posing their own questions directly to Ford, they brought in an outside woman, her last name's Mitchell, to do the questioning for them, which a lot of people gave them a lot of shit for. But honestly, after having watched the hearing, I think it was an excellent, excellent idea because there is no way that Senate Republicans, which on the Judiciary Committee are a bunch of old white dudes, could have ever gotten away with asking the kind of questions to Ford that Mitchell did. 
And I don't say that in saying that like Mitchell's questions were inappropriate or wrong in any way. I think like she did as good a job as she could under the circumstances. But these were not the kind of questions that a senator could have asked or even probably would have even thought to ask. So I I liked that they did that. And actually, I I watched The View today. I know it's it's always on in the background at work because we have ABC on. And even Whoopi Goldberg made the point that she wished that Mitchell had done all of the questioning for both Republicans and Democrats because she was asking like actual legitimate questions to try to get information out of Ford and also out of Kavanaugh because she questioned him too. But I thought that was an interesting thing to say because this is the the hearing was really like a tale of two cities kind of because when Ford was there obviously Senate Republicans did not say much of anything, obviously, because they were not questioning her. Senate Democrats, on the other hand, basically used this as an opportunity to either grandstand for themselves or to sanctify Ford and did not really ask her anything of any kind of substance, which I knew, I mean, I knew this was going to be a shit show. I knew it. Like, I, that, and that's kind of why I didn't want to watch but I think the presence of Mitchell made it less of a shit show. That's my thoughts. I, I, I'm almost, I, I actually agree with Whoopi Goldberg on this one. I wish that Mitchell would have been able to ask all the questions. And I wish that the format was not as it was because what they did was basically they gave every, every Senator on the judiciary committee a five minute block. And so obviously for Ford, all of the Republicans assigned their five-minute block to Mitchell. And then all the Senate Democrats used their five-minute block to do what the fuck ever. I think it would have been much more productive to just have Mitchell question her. Like, just ask questions. I mean, they weren't hard questions. They weren't, like, gotcha questions. It would have made for a much better look, I think, overall. That's my thoughts on that. But something that was very surprising that came up during Ford's testimony, and forgive me, I forget the context of the question in which she was saying this. She said that she wished she had been given the option to have somebody come to her and take her testimony, which obviously was a huge, massive record skip for every one of us who follows this, because that offer was made more than once by Grassley himself, he offered to go himself across the country to California to go take her testimony in her home. Like that was actually put on the table. So it doesn't seem to me that Ford was made aware of that option. And I started thinking about it. And another thing that came up in Ford's testimony was the topic of her legal counsel and who suggested them to her. And she admitted that one of the lawyers that she was using was recommended to her by Feinstein. So, first off, we have the situation where it seems that her legal counsel did not inform her that Grassley would be willing to go to her and take her testimony in whatever venue she felt most comfortable, her home, and a hotel, where, wherever. The second thing, and this is, I, I started thinking about this, and this might be my own little conspiracy theory, but it strikes me as odd knowing that, and then knowing that one of her lawyers was recommended to her by Feinstein. Here's my thing. And this goes back to my my original opinions back on last Sunday about about Ford playing the game, so to speak. What if, I mean, obviously, if she didn't know that Grassley going to her was an option, what if she was actually, like, railroaded into doing this hearing? Because obviously she wasn't aware that there were options to not do it. I've got a lot of questions about that the more I think about it. And it just seems, it seems a little sketchy to me. 
knowing that one of her lawyers was recommended by Feinstein and then she was not presented with the fact that she could indeed do this testimony in private, in her own home, that that was actually offered to her. And yeah, that strikes me as a little odd. Like what is going on here? Like even, yeah, I've, I've got questions about that. But kind of kind of moving on from that. That's that's something that I think needs to be addressed and I don't think it ever will. But another thing that struck me about Mitchell's line of questioning, both with Ford and with Kavanaugh, was the questions themselves, which didn't necessarily always pertain to the actual Ford allegations. Like very little was actually said about that. A lot of the questions seem to be geared towards kind of the process of everything that has happened over the past two weeks about as far as like the letter and how it was released and everything around that. And I think it it really struck me that it felt like somebody, Senate Republicans, trying to get Ford and Kavanaugh on record as as speaking on this topic for perhaps the pro- the purpose of maybe a special counsel later on down the road to address how exactly this situation happened. I just got that kind of vibe from it. Like that's that's kind of it cuz like I said a lot of the questioning was not about the actual Ford allegations. Like very little was said about that. So much more was discussed about the past two weeks, which have nothing to do with Ford's allegations. So why was that even really discussed unless there's another, somebody's trying to go down another path? Like this was supposed to be a hearing to adjudicate on Ford's allegations against Kavanaugh, but we really didn't talk about them. So what the fuck was really going on here? And so to wrap up my thoughts, at least on the Ford side of the testimony, this is really like, I don't know, this is weird, but I I feel like I was watching her testimony and to be p- perfectly honest, I stopped after a while because I saw what this was going to be. It's like basically, basically Mitchell trying to ask her actual substantive questions in this ridiculously stupid five minute format, which... Even by the end of Ford's testimony, you could tell that Mitchell was annoyed with because it's like every time she started getting on a roll of trying to like ask questions and get information, she's either interrupted by another senator or the five minute mark. Yeah, it was just, it was a really fucking stupid format. But watching Ford herself, like everybody talks about how composed and how calm and like, oh, I, I, I don't really go with all that. To me, she looked really unprepared. And when I say unprepared, I mean like, like her legal team didn't explain to her what this was about to be, like what the process was, what the format was, what the kind of questions would be. She just seemed like really lost during a lot of it. And I don't, I don't want to cast aspirations on the woman because I don't know, I don't, I I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road, but she just seemed like... There, there are points of it where she really just seemed, I was like, why, why is she doing this? Like, why did her team not prep her? Like, there were points where, like, she had to stop and reread things. And I'm like, why didn't that happen before the hearing? It just, it, it felt weird to me. Like, I don't know. It, it was, it just, it just struck me as odd. Like, she just seemed, like, weirdly unprepared and kind of like a deer in the headlights. And I was just like, who, who didn't prep her? Like, I know there's no way to really prep for that, especially if you've never been in that situation, but I don't know. It struck me as weird. Tell me what y'all think about it, because it just, I don't know. There, there's there's a lot about this whole hearing that I don't know. But let's, let's move on to Kavanaugh. Holy shit. To start with... I think it was probably Tuesday, if memory serves, that 
his opening statements were leaked. Well, not only, I don't want to say leaked, released to the public. And then Ford's were on Wednesday. I do remember that. So his were before hers. But the, the oh, his prepared opening statements, which both of them had prepared opening statements, by the way, you have that you have X amount of time, like you have all the time in the world. You can have this prepared statement. You can talk for as long as you want. You can talk about whatever you want. Nobody can interrupt you. Nobody can say anything. That's what that was. So the the leaked one was, I mean, fine enough, fairly benign. He didn't go with that one. He wrote a new one. Oh boy, did he write a new one. If memory serves, he went for a little over half an hour and it was insane. Like he basically just laid out every fucking thing. Like there was at one point I tweeted out, it was like, Jesus fucking Christ, what questions are there going to be to ask after he's done with this opening statement? Because he addressed everything. The drinking, the yearbook, the other allegations, the Ford allegations, like Pretty much anything that you could possibly have thought to ask this man, he addressed in the opening statements. And, yes, he came in hot. Very hot. Very, very hot. And this has been a very divisive thing amongst people. But he was angry, to put it politely. And he did cry a couple of times. Yes, in mentioning his wife and his children. So it was, it was wild. And actually, actually my, I don't know if this was my favorite moment, but he almost dropped an F-bomb. Like I swear to God, this dude almost dropped an F-bomb. When he was talking about how many times the FBI has done a background check on him, he, he caught himself, but you could tell he was about to say six separate fucking times, but he caught himself on the F. I was like, Damn, dude, like, you were pissed. Like, this dude was like, he was, he was, yeah, he was loaded. Loaded for bore on this one. Like, he was not, he was not having it. And it pretty much set the tone for the whole hearing with him going forward. And I mean, it just kept being just wild from there. And speaking of loaded for bore, Lindsey fucking Graham, he took his five minutes and instead of asking Kavanaugh, I think maybe he asked Kavanaugh one question, maybe two, I don't remember. He took his five minutes and used it to pop the fuck off on every Democrat in the room, on everything that happened over the past two weeks, on how everything was handled. Like, I will, I will find a link and put it in the show notes. It is wild. Like, dude just went off. Like, I don't think... Between the Kavanaugh opening statements and Lindsey Graham losing his shit, I don't know what is the most insane thing I think I've ever seen happen in the Senate during a hearing. Like, it's, I cannot overstate it. Like, dude just, like, he lost his shit. He completely fucking lost his shit. And it's just like, oh my god, Lindsey, where the hell did you come from? But it was just, the, the hearings, like, if you are so inclined... You can go back and watch all of the video. I mean, it's up on YouTube. I think if you want to watch a full, unedited, like, non, non-clipfied non version of it, C-SPAN has it up, I think. But, yeah, it was just, it's one definitely one of the most bizarre, surreal things I think I've ever seen go down in the Senate in my life. And it's, I, I still, 24 hours later, I'm still not entirely sure what I think of it. Like it was, it it was and was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. In some ways it was a lot better, but in some ways it was way, way worse. And so, well, it's happened. It's done. It's in the history books. One thing that I do kind of want to talk about before we leave out of this is there were direct questions put to Ford and actually to, I think this was actually during Kavanaugh's, Kavanaugh's testimony, but Feinstein threw Ford under the bus because there was a line of questioning about how the, how the letter became public. 
And she basically said that the reason the letter became public is because Ford talked to her friends about this incident. And I was just like, wow. Really? For somebody who I still think outed Ford in this whole thing, that was just like stunning to me. I was just like, God damn, what the hell? But moving forward, like I said, there has been a massive, massive split in the reactions especially to Kavanaugh's testimony. Some people view it as obviously very much like you, you totally get it. Like you understand, especially the opening statement in particular, there's a lot of people who look at it like, yes, that that's what needed to happen. And some people look at it as like, that was the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't even understand why he did that. And it's, it's fascinating to me to watch people have two totally different opinions on this. And like, even on my Twitter timeline to watch just people that I follow and I follow people that typically have somewhat of the same ideological bent. There, there are some differences, but the split was interesting to see how many people were like, yeah, he, he was totally, totally vindicated in doing that. And people being like, no, he shouldn't have did that. That was the wrong tactic. It it looks horrible. It's bad. It it just uh it was weird. It's something that I think warrants a little more thinking from me. Like I kind of like I kind of want to go a little deeper on this topic, but I want to take some time and think about it a little more. Something I do have definite feelings on right now though is this criticism of Kavanaugh for being emotional in his opening statements in the first place. Okay. Here's something I don't understand. I've watched both opening statements live. Okay. Kavanaugh was on fire, but Ford was not unemotional either. Like the whole time she was giving her opening statement, she was pretty much on the verge of tears. Like she was fighting back tears. Like it's not like she was this unemotional person. It's just, I don't know, I guess her emotions were okay and Kavanaugh's weren't, which is, again, kind of goes back to that that thing that I'm trying to think through about how men display emotions versus women display emotions and how it's okay versus not okay versus wanted versus not wanted anyway. But I don't think that the criticism of Kavanaugh being emotional in his opening statement were entirely warranted because take a look at Kavanaugh's situation and what he's been through through the past two weeks. Like basically he's lived the last two weeks of his life in a Kafka novel. And so I can understand being angry. And if it were me in that position and you're being given an opportunity in those opening statements to rain fire on the heads of the people who just destroyed your life and you know you can do it and nobody's going to stop you. There's no time limit. They can't interrupt you. I don't know as if I wouldn't have taken the same course of action. Like, I don't know as if I wouldn't have done a statement somewhat similar to his. Like, I get it. Like, I, I understand being incredibly angry about this situation. And I've thought that up until then, Kavanaugh has actually been really restrained, like way more than any other person would be, I think. I mean, aside from the Fox News interview, the only statements he's released is through like PR and stuff like that. He's not spoken to anybody. He's not really said anything. I mean, even before the Fox interview, pretty much the only things he said was, I'm not dropping out. So, I mean, okay, maybe this was not the bestest venue for it, but I get it. Like, I understand wanting to have that moment and to just unleash all of your anger at the people who deserve it. Like, these are the people that have fucked your life up. And so, yeah, maybe torching them isn't, like, the most mature or wonderful thing to do, but I get it. And I don't, I don't hate them for doing it. Like, I don't, I don't think he was wrong. I don't, I don't really think the opening statement was wrong, but I leave everybody to their opinion on this. I don't think 
anybody's opinion is wrong. I think it's, you can feel however you want to feel about it. That is fine. Moving on to today, where the Judiciary Committee was meeting and voting on whether to release Kavanaugh's nomination to an open vote on the Senate floor. And we were almost there. It was almost going to happen. But then Jeff Flake had to come in off the top rope and say that he was giving his vote on the Judiciary Committee. He would vote yes on Kavanaugh, provided that there would be another FBI background check done. (sighs) Okay. And he put on it the stipulation that it would only be a week, which... I mean, first of all, this is not Jeff Flake's decision on whether any of this happens. Oh my god, we have another fucking week of this. I can't. I can't do this. Not another week. God damn it, Jeff. But, so, that's where we're at right now. I'm not entirely sure whether the FBI thing is going to happen. Trump has actually given it his blessing, which I was surprised. He was, Trump was way more way more calm and cool and even-headed about this new revelation than I expected him to be. Like, I expected him to, like, pop off and be pissed. But his stance is like, okay, I want I want to give them whatever they need, whatever they want. If if it's what they need, then I will, I will give it to them. And he's actually signed off on asking the FBI to do this background check. So... I don't know. Mitch McConnell, right before I I had to start recording, made a tweet saying that they plan on voting next week on Kavanaugh. So I don't know if the FBI thing is happening at this point. It's kind of up in the air. I'm very confused. But that brings us to now. Oh my God. This week has been really really fucking bad. Like, this has just been so horrible. Like, I can't... This this is... And, and this is this is my opinion. And I know this is probably not going to be a popular one right now, but I really wish none of this had been made public. I wish Feinstein had stayed sitting on the letter. I predicted that nothing good would come of this, and I have been right. Very, very right, I do think. And I just, this week has been depressing, even more so than the last one, because watching how low people have been willing to go to try to root for, quote unquote, their team and, quote unquote, their people, it's just been, it's, it, it, it's been really weird and depressing. And I just, I don't. I wish, I wish this never happened. Honestly, I do. And even Mitchell and something that I, I thought about when I was watching the, this, the Senate hearing was that this could have all happened in private. Like if you really wanted to take this seriously, when you got the letter, you could have hired Mitchell or somebody like her to question Ford in private and to question Kavanaugh in private too, if you wished, compiled those filings and then decided from there where you wanted to go. Like, it's just, I'm still so, so sad about how this could have happened so much differently that could have preserved Ford's integrity, could have preserved Kavanaugh's integrity. Oh my God, this is just, it's so, it's sad. It really is. And the and the other thing is, and I and I know I talked about it last time, but there is there is no satisfying conclusion to this story. There's not going to be any outcome whether Kavanaugh is confirmed, he's not confirmed, he withdraws, Trump pulls his nomination, which is not gonna happen. But there's no there's no satisfying conclusion to the story for everybody. Like, there's always going to be people that are going to be pissed about this, no matter what happens. And for what it's worth, I think that both Ford and Kavanaugh are telling their truths. 
but we will never know the truth because there's no way to know it. And that's what's, that's what's always struck me as so ridiculous about the whole Senate hearing. And now I guess this may be new FBI background check is there's nothing, there's nothing new to be known. Like there's nothing new to be said here. So I don't, I don't get to keep going down this road. Like I, there's nothing, you're not going to find anything. Like there's nothing to be found. Like it's just, it is what it is. And everybody's got to figure out a way to get their heads around that. And like I said, I think they are both telling their truth. Like I did not find either one of them to be not credible. I mean, you can, you can be pissed about how Kavanaugh presented himself, whatever. He was very emphatic about his points. Ford was very emphatic about her points, but they automatically like refute each other. Like both of them can't be true, but I can think that both of them are telling their truth. And that's the problem with this is there's no, there's no way of adjudicating this. Like there's no, there's no good way to decide the objective truth on this other than to look at the few facts that we do have, which is that Ford is making an allegation. She does not have anybody to corroborate this allegation. Kavanaugh is making an allegation that he did not do this. He has people to corroborate that. And that's it. That, I mean, you can talk about everything else. You can talk about credibility. You can talk about likability. You can talk about who you believe or don't believe. That is the only set of facts that we have on this case. And as far as I'm concerned, those are the only things that you should be using to try to adjudicate this. And I know it's not a criminal trial. I know this is a Senate SCOTUS confirmation hearing, but you have to try at some point to apply something approximating fairness to this situation. And you have to look at the facts that are presented in front of you. And like I said, I'm sure Ford is telling her truth. Like I did not, I I never thought she was lying, but I have to look at the fact that one person has people willing to corroborate his story and the other person does not. So, I mean, what else, what else am I supposed to do with this? Like what else is anybody who wants to be fair and rational and non-emotional about this supposed to do with this? other than look at that and say, well, I mean, wh- where do you, where do you want us to go from here? Like, what do you want, what do you want anybody to decide on this? Like, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing else. There's not going to be any kind of like, like concrete physical evidence or anything like that. That's going to make the decision for you. So it's just, I know it's an ugly situation. It's nasty, but I do think that you do have to maintain some level of rationality and some commitment to fairness and justice and looking at the facts of a situation and not going off of who you find credible for whatever reason you find them credible. And to add to that point, we're not talking about people who don't exist. And I think that's something that's kind of getting lost here is Ford and Kavanaugh and their families and their friends and everybody involved in this are real people. These are not actors in a TV show or a movie that you're watching. They're real life people who have had their lives ruined now at this point. I mean, no matter what happens, I think we can all agree that both people, I mean, they're, it's, it's done. Their lives a root and like you're, you're forever defined by this moment. It's just, I can't, I, I can't move past the fact that there's like real people have lost so much off the back of what started out as a cheap political stunt. Like the releasing of the letter was just it, that it was that it was a cheap political stunt And now we've gotten to this point where like Ford has had death threats. Her family has had death threats. They've had to move here, there and whatever. Kavanaugh's family's had death threats. His wife, his children, 
Like, his name is being dragged through the mud. Her name's being dragged through the mud. Like, what the fuck? Like, these are people. These are real people. This isn't a game. Like, I don't, like, I don't understand the lack of, like, empathy that anybody has for both of these people. Like, no matter who you believe, you gotta admit, this situation is pure shit for both of them. And especially, especially on Ford's part. Because, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't know. It's my weird little conspiracy theory about her being kind of railroaded into this, but what she said, even per her own testimony during the hearing, was that she never consented to any of this becoming public. She never consented to her letter becoming public. And per her testimony, the point of the letter was not to become this fucking shit show, but to let somebody know back when Kavanaugh was on a short list, back before he was even the nominee, that she had this allegation and her her hope was, the idea behind doing this, was that if she told somebody about this, maybe they would pick somebody else. That was That was her stated goal in sending the letter in the first place. And so I just, I can't, I I feel bad for the woman. I do still feel bad for the woman because she never wanted this. She never asked for this. This is actually the opposite of what she fucking asked for. And to be put in this position is just, oh my God, I can't, I can't imagine. I cannot imagine what it is like to be her, to, oh my God, I would... Whew, I, I would be very mad. I would be much, much more angry than she is, apparently. But, yeah, I mean, it's just, this this all could have been handled differently. This all could have been handled way better, way more professionally, way more privately, in accordance to her wishes. If you really gave a shit about her wishes, which obviously nobody fucking did, because nobody asked her if she wanted to be part of this shit. But if you did... This all could have been done way, way differently. And as far as I'm concerned, Feinstein needs to be held responsible for this because this has gone so far beyond anything that is even remotely acceptable that there. I think there does need to be a special counsel, whether whatever happens, whether he gets, he gets confirmed, he doesn't get confirmed, he drops out, he gets pulled, whatever. There needs to be some kind of investigation about how this all happened because this has done just so much damage to political discourse in general and just the reputation of Senate, which obviously I don't care about because I think they're all a bunch of idiots anyway. But I mean, just that, the Supreme Court nominee process, it's just, oh my God, this has done... This has done damage I don't really know if you walk back from, honestly. I don't, I don't know how you walk these past two weeks back. I really don't, because things have gone to such a dark and ugly place. I just, I don't, I don't know. And there's one tweet, and I want to read it to you. It's from Jennifer Rubin, and it just, to me, it completely sums up how fucked up this a whole thing has gotten. Here's her tweet. With him screaming and interrupting senators, I can imagine him putting his hand over someone's mouth. Seriously? You typed that out and you looked at it and you said, yeah, this is a good tweet and mash that tweet button. I what the fuck? I mean, who, what the fuck kind of person tweets that in the first place? I mean, that's insane. Like, what? Did you seriously just equate somebody being pissed off at Congress to attempted rape? Like, did you really? Did you fucking really? But that's just an example of how insanely dark and ugly this moment has gone. And it just, it, it bothers me. It really genuinely does because it's, like I said, I don't, I don't know how you walk this shit back. I don't know if you do. I don't know. This might have literally just fucking broke everything. I I don't know. I do know. It's just, I don't, I don't like it. I'm not comfortable with it. 
I am somebody who tries to be a hell of a lot more optimistic. I I like I like Palomas and I like tiny goat videos and I don't like people tweeting shit like that because that's just so fucking dark and fucked up. But I want to go ahead and wrap this up on one more point that I did hit on last time, but I do want to kind of wrap it up with this and that is because I keep seeing it happening and I told people not to do it, but nobody listens to me. And that's this whole idea of it's a job interview, which fuck off with that. I know I said it last week, but this is not a fucking job interview. This is the rest of this dude's life. This is Kavanaugh's, his, his reputation, his legacy, his past body of work. Like this is, if it was just a job interview, people wouldn't be weaponizing it the way they are. Like this is just, I just, I can't fucking stand that argument that it's a, it's a job interview. No, it's way more than that. Don't fucking kid yourself. And everybody who peddles that line, they know better too. So, okay, we have gone far, far, far too long. (laughs) I'm sorry for that. If you've made it all the way through this, thank you. And as always, rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care and until next time.